Good afternoon. My name is Marshall Chin. I'm one of the associate directors of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and the director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Finding Answers Disparities Research for Change program. And on behalf of our team, I'd like to welcome you to this fourth in our series of lectures on healthcare reform and the ethics of healthcare reform, sponsored by the McLean Center and the Buxbaum Institute. So today we're delighted to have Dean Kenneth Polanski present on the impact of the Affordable Care Act and healthcare reform on the University of Chicago's mission. I think most of us here know uh, the highlights of, of Dr. Polanski's career. Well, I'd just, just like to just point out a few key points that I think are particularly relevant for his talk today. So Dr. Polanski was born in Johannesburg, South Africa. And like many people growing up in South Africa, uh, he grew up playing rugby, which is a sport like football, but without a helmet and without pads. So I'll let you be the judge of what that means about uh, Dean Polanski. <clears throat> um, but also uh, in South Africa, uh, he was raised really during the height of apartheid. And uh, it was a time where with the secret police, you had to be very careful uh, with what you did. But during his time as a medical student at the University of Witwatersrand, he did his part as part of some of the mass student demonstrations. Uh, he came to the, University, uh, to the Chicago uh, after his medical school training, first was a resident in internal medicine at Michael Reese, and then started his career at the University of Chicago as a fellow in, in, in endocrinology, and really had a, a meteoric, meteoric rise where, at age 37, he became the chief of the section of endocrinology. And then at age 43, which is sort of an age where most clinician investigators may be, if they are good and if they're lucky, maybe just starting to feel comfortable. At age 43, he won the American Diabetes Association's highest scientific award, basically the Career Achievement Award, uh, for work at, with the pancreatic beta cell looking at insulin secretion. In 1999, he left the University of Chicago to become the chair of medicine at Washington University in St. Louis, which historically has been one of the top five medicine programs in the country. A uh, big program, large clinical operation, in some ways, he had to deal with some of the issues that he's had to address over the past three years. I'll just say a couple more things about Dean Polanski uh, since his arrival here um, in 2010. Uh, first is that despite all his personal accomplishments and accolades, he's always been great with junior people, uh, helping to nurture careers. Uh, my third year on faculty, he played a key role in helping me get my own diabetes research program off the ground. The last thing I'll mention is that the University of Chicago, in some ways, is a paradoxical institution where, in one sense, we're innovative. You know, we have Nobel Prize winners. We're at the forefront of medicine. But in some, time, in some ways, we're a very conservative organization. And in many ways, the business plan for the medical center had been static over the past 20 years, which largely relied upon uh, fee-for-service volume, essentially keeping the equivalent of the center for care uh, and discovery filled with beds, its beds being filled. But in the past three years since the dean uh, took over and brought in his new team, I think we've actually seen more changes than in the prior 15 years. I think one of the tensions that the dean will talk about is this challenge between the current system of fee-for-service, keeping the beds uh, filled in something like the CCD, versus the current challenges which are going to start incentivizing population management, global payments, care coordination, preventive care, community engagement. And in some ways, unless that is solved, we don't survive as a medical center. So, Dean Polanski. So, thank you very much, Marshall, and it's uh, delightful to be here, and I hope we'll have a good session and a good discussion at the end. There'll be plenty of time. I'm not going to take nearly the whole time for my presentation, and I know there'll be a lot of questions and discussion, and we have many experts uh, in the room who will be able to impact on that. So this is the outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to first, uh, for those of you who don't know, but be sure that we're all on the same page, what is the Affordable Care Act and how will it alter our clinical practice, a very important uh, set of issues. Uh, what is the likely impact on our finances? Um, and I know that when I give talks to faculty, the last thing they want to hear about is finances, but as you'll see uh, in this context, that is very important. Uh, and then how do we plan to respond? Uh, and how do we plan to continue to be an outstanding uh, medical center and medical school uh, in the changing environment? So what is the Affordable Care Act and how will it alter our clinical practice? Well, I think the first thing to just talk about uh, is the rationale for the Affordable Care Act. And as you know, uh, the major rationale is that there are a large number of 
people in the United States uh, without health insurance. Uh, the exact number is really unknown. Uh, these are the estimates are usually around this number, whether it's a little bit more, a little bit less. I think this is the order of magnitude. And as you know, there are a number of reasons uh, why people do not have health insurance. Um, unaffordability is a, a very major one, often in the context of not having a job. So as you know, health insurance at the moment is largely tied to being employed. Uh, and if you're not employed, uh, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, uh, to afford health care insurance. Uh, illegal immigrants do not have uh, access to health insurance, and this is a big uh, number of uh, people, particularly in uh, border states. Uh, jobs that do not offer health insurance. So there are many uh, jobs now in the United States, part-time jobs in particular, uh, where as part of the employment agreement, uh, they don't get health insurance just as we do uh, at, uh, at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Uh, there are actually a number of people in the millions uh, who make an economic decision not to purchase health insurance. And these are predominantly young people, as you know, um, when you're young, you think you're invincible, nothing bad can happen to you. As you get to my age, you begin to realize that that's not the case, or I began to realize that a long time ago. Uh, and so people look at the cost of healthcare insurance and they say, I'm healthy, and if something happens to me, highly unlikely, I'll pay for it out of pocket. And there are actually millions of people uh, that are in that category. And, and this was a big uh, issue of contention when the president was first elected uh, between him and Hillary Clinton in, the, in that campaign as you will recall. Now, um, the other issue, which is an interesting one, um, is that there are many people who are eligible for either Medicare or Medicaid uh, who, for one reason or another, don't sign up. Uh, and the paperwork is not insignificant, and particularly if you are an older person and you're living on your own and you don't have uh, access to resources to help you, uh, it's a quite a daunting thing. And then there are people who are excluded because of prior medical history. So people who have serious illnesses, they either are completely uninsurable in the current climate uh, or it's unaffordable. So there are a variety of reasons why many uh, people who live in the United States do not have health insurance. And the Congressional Budget Office estimates that by 2022, the Affordable Care Act will have extended coverage to most, but not actually all of these people who are uninsured. And we can get back to that uh, in a short while. So that was the rationale. And the basics of the act uh, are sort of summarized on the next couple of slides. I've tried to just go over them in broad, general detail. Um, the first is that just about everyone in the United States will be required to have health insurance. There are a few exceptions. The illegal immigrants is by far and away the largest group. Prisoners, uh, there are a small number of groups uh, that are not going to be required to have health insurance. Uh, the act prohibits lifetime monetary caps on insurance coverage, and you know that's a feature of our current healthcare insurance plans. Uh, it prevents exclusion for pre-existing conditions. Uh, it prevents coverage cancellation, except in the cases of fraud. And it establishes the share of premiums dedicated to medical services, and also the essential health benefits that each plan must offer. And you can look at that on many websites now, and it goes over the elements of the plan. And they actually are very robust. These are going to be very good, uh, significant insurance plans. Um, and uh, they're very similar to the, the services are very similar to the services that we are accustomed to with University of Chicago Health Insurance or the Medical Center Health Insurance. And it's uh, acute hospitalization, it's drug coverage, it's psychiatric benefits, it's uh, outpatient, it's a whole variety of things. And, and there are minimum standards uh, that the health insurance industry has to offer uh, under each of these plans. Now, in addition to that, uh, employers are required to cover their full-time employees uh, or pay penalties except for small businesses that employ less than 50 people. So uh, the um, employer basis, uh, although it's going to be modified as you'll see, uh, to health insurance is going to continue and small businesses do not have that requirement but there are other alternatives as you'll see. The implementation of the employer mandate was delayed for one year until January the 1st, 2015, and I'm sure you read about that in the newspapers and there was a lot of uh, political brouhaha about it back and forth. Now, <laughs> um, tax credits are available for small businesses that cover specified costs of health insurance for their employees, and individuals without health insurance will have to pay penalties 
uh, starting off with modest penalties in 2014, $95 for an adult, $285 for a family, uh, rising to significantly higher levels, but not overwhelming in 2016. And there's been a lot of discussion about whether this is really an adequate uh, incentive for people uh, to sign up for uh, health insurance, or whether many people will still decide that they're rather going to just pay the penalty uh, and take their chances. And then young adults uh, are able to stay on their uh, parents' health plans until the age of 26, and that's a uh, very significant change, and many of you are likely affected by this, and certainly your children would be. Now, in addition to the economics and the way in which health insurance is set up in the United States, what is anticipated or what I think is hoped for in the plan, both the president and the people who designed this plan, is that what it will do is it will result in a fundamental transformation in the way in which we think about health care in the United States. And this is what I think we should really focus on, and this is what I think is the challenge for all providers, including the University of Chicago. And what is envisioned <coughs> is that we go from the present situation to a future state. And the present situation, as you know, is one in which uh, it's almost exclusively fee-for-service for each encounter. Patient goes to the doctor or gets admitted to the hospital. Uh, we, um, the person is insured. Uh, the provider then submits the bill to the health insurance uh, and uh, gets paid for each of the services. Now, under this arrangement, the payers take the risk. <coughs> we don't take the risk. Um, the uh, providers then focus largely, maybe not only, but largely on their episodes of care. So when patient comes to see you, you, you obviously may pay some attention to the other consultants that they're seeing. Uh, we do pay attention when people get admitted to the hospital, what happened before, what's going to happen afterwards, but, but the, the, the focus on that is relatively limited. And what this leads to is fragmentation, because each provider is focused primarily on what they have to do and their role in delivery of care to the patient and what's happening in the broader life of the patient uh, is uh, not a requirement uh, for the current system. Reimbursement is based primarily on volume and there's a big emphasis on commercial insurance. Now in the future state, and, and obviously we don't know exactly how this is going to evolve, so this I think represents the best thinking of many people, and these are not my personal ideas, I've obviously read a fair amount about the topic, um, is that th we are going to evolve over a period of time uh, to some future state in which uh, providers will need to focus on maintaining and improving the health of populations and that we will be paid on the basis of how well we are able to do that. Now, what's also envisioned is that the providers will assume significant risk. And what we mean by that uh, is that in addition to getting paid, or as part of getting paid for providing care, uh, the outcome will be taken into account, certain outcomes that will be defined, and if you meet the outcomes or you meet the expectations, you'll get a full payment. If you don't, you may get a penalty. You may get an, if you do, you may get an additional payment. And at least some of the reimbursement uh, is going to be dependent on not just whether you gave the service or not, which is the current situation, but what was the outcome to the patient. Um, and it could be process. Did you do the right thing? Did, did, did all, of the, all of the appropriate people get their colonoscopies and their, uh, their breast exams and get their cholesterols checked? It could be process, but it could also be outcome. How many of your diabetic patients are at a target for hemoglobin A1C, indicative of good glucose control? Now, um, so outcomes are very important, and there also will be incentives to reduce utilization of expensive services. And there will be a focus on a lot of those. The one that is the most uh, immediate for us uh, is readmissions, and there now is a significant component of uh, Medicare reimbursement that is tied for the re readmission rate to the hospital, and there's a lot of focus both in this hospital and in essentially every hospital across the country uh, to ensure that our patients are uh, not readmitted to the hospital more frequently than is expected by the data. There are complicated methodologies uh, to, to look into this. Now the other thing which you'll see is, is going to be really critical is that there will be an increasing importance uh, of government insurance 
And that's a part of the basis uh, of the, uh, you know, the political controversy and, uh, and uh, difficulty that this bill has been facing. Um, so let me talk a little bit about population health management because this is something that is a, a sort of a broad general concept that many of you may have some uh, idea about, but the truth is uh, very few health providers in the United States have actually implemented successfully uh, an overall population health management program. There are a couple, you know, Kaiser's <coughs> probably one, there, there are a variety of providers in, uh, maybe one or two in, in Illinois, but the vast majority of us have had no experience with this. And the, there are a number of essential elements uh, that people believe is essential uh, if one is to be able to provide uh, good health uh, or promote the health of populations. So the first is that you need to have a large network to balance adverse selection and create scale for comprehensive programs. The second is that there needs to be a high level of coordination between different areas of the delivery system. So if you're going to take care of the health of the population, it really matters what happens to the person after they're discharged from the hospital. So the hospital is now going to have to set in place mechanisms to follow patients after they're discharged to ensure that they take their medications, that they see their doctors, and that they don't get readmitted because if they get readmitted, there's going to be a financial penalty for the hospital. Um, there will be a big focus on post-acute care, that's what I've been talking about, after the acute episode, to maintain health and reduce readmissions. Information systems that span different venues of care, including the community. So clearly, hospitals and physicians are going to have to reach out way beyond our current borders uh, into the community uh, to get data, find out what's happening with these patients, are they taking their medications, how are they doing, do they need to come in for an, uh, a, a visit to prevent an admission because they ha they're not doing as well as we would have anticipated. Now, um, although this is very foreign uh, to the way we are currently practicing, um, I think that most people believe that academic medical centers can and should and will play a critical role in many of these systems, not all of them. And I think the role that the academic medical centers will be able to play uh, will be to help everybody figure it out because not everybody, you know, most people don't know exactly what to do. Um, obviously the academic medical centers will primarily uh, provide tertiary and quaternary care, uh, education, uh, quality metrics, uh, analytic capability, a variety of different things that are not usually uh, easily provided uh, by the average community hospital and even the sophisticated community hospital. Now, as you can see, this all sounds actually outstanding. I mean, it's really good if one can develop a system that is going to enable us to do this. I think it would be beneficial for patients. It would be beneficial for society in general. Uh, but there are a number of risks and questions and uncertainties and I've just sort of put a couple of them up here and maybe in the discussion time we can talk about additional ones uh, that we don't know about. So will reimbursement be adequate for older, sicker, more vulnerable populations compared to young healthy populations? Clearly if you're, if you're in an inner city neighborhood and you've got a lot of elderly people in your immediate service area and there's a large amount of illness there, uh, the risks, if you're going to be sharing in this risk compared to a young healthy population out in the suburbs um, is going to be very different. Is the reimbursement going to be adequate to take that into account? To what extent is it appropriate to hold the health system responsible for outcomes uh, compared to provision of services? So to get back to the example of a person with diabetes, uh, let's say you have two patients with diabetes and you've decided that they need to be on a program of uh, diet and exercise and weight loss and you implement the identical program in these two patients and one does extremely well and loses 30 pounds and their blood sugars come down to the normal range and the other person just doesn't follow the uh, program and is exactly where they were before and they're doing very poorly, is it really appropriate uh, that the physician and or the hospital should be penalized for the different outcomes of the two patients uh, even though the same program has been implemented. If a person has very serious uh, advanced cancer and you, in the best faith, you follow uh, what are appropriate guidelines and you give them chemotherapy and the outcome is very bad, to what extent should you be held harmless uh, for that or, sh or should you really uh, share in, 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 in the problem? 
So, so these are questions that are unanswered. Uh, can we actually assume risk and maintain financial viability? And this is a big challenge for us, and I can certainly tell you that at the moment it would be very difficult for us to assume financial risk for large numbers of patients because it requires a whole set of infrastructure elements uh, that we don't currently have. And then finally, is it really possible to differentiate between providers based on quality, or will it just be the price? Uh, and as you'll see, the system has got very severe financial constraints, um, and, and so the concern of many uh, will, is that, that the differentiation won't really be on quality, because often the differentiation of quality is very difficult, but price is certainly relatively easy. So will this be uh, the lowest cost providers? So that's kind of the general uh, overview of the Affordable Care Act, the rationale, and some of the major elements. And I'm sure that uh, many of you knew most of it, and uh, some of you know more about it than I do. So now I'd like to talk about the, um, the overall impact on our finances. Um, and uh, I don't know if the, the color doesn't seem to be good on this big screen, but if you look at the small screen, uh, this is a pie chart, and I have focused on the BSD uh, in uh, the, the BSD revenue 2013, and uh, we'll come to the hospital in a moment. And what you can basically see from that is that the two blue, uh, the, the two blue areas, um, the, the, the large one is clinical revenue. So this is the clinical revenue that the BSD faculty earns uh, by seeing patients, either from the inpatient or the outpatient, accounts for 260 million uh, of our revenue and transfers from the hospital about 200 million. So of our total budget of 688 million, uh, 460 million approximately uh, comes from our clinical programs. So essentially two thirds of the budget, and this includes investment in the medical school, the students, the graduate programs, the shared infrastructure, the research, everything that we do is included in this. Um, and so you can see that the healthcare budget uh, is a really big deal uh, because what we do at this point is we reinvest money that we earn from healthcare in our academic programs. And that is what is a primary support, a major support, not the only support of our academic programs. Now, what about um, the hospital and, and the insurance coverage for our patients? So these are the data from the medical center. And our patients, as you know, are, are divided but from an insurance standpoint into two broad categories. There are those that are covered by commercial insurance and there are those that are covered by government programs. Now, commercial insurance accounts for 40% of our volume. If you take the aggregate volume for inpatient and outpatient, approximately 40% of those patients are covered by commercial payers. Um, and the Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the biggest, and then we have others, United, a whole series of private insurance companies that I'm sure you're familiar with the names. Now, the importance of this is that the commercially insured patients account for 100% of the profitability that we have, and the profitability, the reason that we, we want to make money uh, is that we want to invest in our hospital. Uh, in have a capital budget and we want to be able to support academic programs. That's what supports the $200 million transfer to the Biological Sciences Division. So the, the commercial patients are, account for 100% of the profitability and they also cover the losses from the government programs. So the two government programs at this point, Medicare and Medicaid, account for 60% of the volume, inpatient and outpatients, and these programs don't cover our costs. So if you look at them in the aggregate, it just uh, in some, for some diagnoses and for some admissions, they actually do, and in some we even make a little money. But if you look at it in the aggregate, uh, we lose money on both of those programs, uh, particularly Illinois Medicaid. And Illinois Medicaid um, is amongst the lowest uh, reimburser in the country. We're in the, somewhere between around 45 out of 50. Um, and not only that, because of the uh, of the, the, um, the, the problems with the finances in the state of Illinois, uh, we wait more than 200 days before we get paid. So uh, that's, a, that's a long time to wait, and obviously it causes a lot of difficulty for us. Now we are, 
uh, one of the largest uh, Medicaid providers in the state of Illinois, and I'll show you the numbers. And this is part of our mission. So we are proud that we do that. We're very committed to that. We're going to continue to do that. Uh, but uh, it does provide us with a number of constraints and challenges in terms of just making it, because as you can see, uh, we have to recycle the commercial. So again, if you look at the, the numbers, um, the total medical center patient care reimbursements are around $1.3 billion a year. Uh, Medicare is 249 and Medicaid is 210. So you can already see that uh, 460 out of 1.3 billion is 60% of the, of the activity. So you can already get a sense that uh, we are paid very much less for Medicare and Medicaid than we are for private insurance. And Medicare payments include residency training, there's a disproportionate share payment which is going away with the Affordable Care Act. And uh, Medicaid is, is very complicated. I'll talk about that in a little bit more, uh, in a little bit more detail. But, but you get the picture that we are very dependent on commercial insurance uh, to maintain the financial viability of the hospital. We take care of Medicaid patients uh, because that's part of our mission. And just that everybody understand. So Medicare is a federal uh, program uh, for people predominantly over the age of 65, although it does cover certain other things like renal dialysis. Uh, Medicaid is a program uh, for people who are poor uh, and um, disabled uh, and uh, you know, other serious uh, vulnerable categories. Uh, and this is paid for both by, it's a state-run program, but significantly subsidized by the federal government. So that's um, just, uh, you know, sets that straight. Now, if you, if you compare us to our peers across the country in terms of the, the, the programs that we lose money on versus what we make money on, as we said, 60% of, medic, of medical center admissions are covered by Medicare and Medicaid. The double AMC, if you go to the double AMC, academic medical center teaching hospitals, um, about f the average median, the, the median is around 50%. So we're about 10% higher. Uh, each percentage point is probably somewhere between five and $10 million a year. So not insignificant amounts of money. Now, 30% of our admissions are Medicaid admissions. Northwestern is 15%. Uh, Rush is about 20%, a little bit more than that. Loyola is around 20%, the low 20s. Evanston Hospital, 10%. Uh, Edward Hospital uh, in DuPage County is about 5%. So that just uh, gives you some sense. Now, if you look at our admissions, um, our Medicaid days, this is the University of Chicago Medicine. Um, and uh, so we had 46,720 Medicaid days out of a total of 148,000, so 31.6. Um, and the case mix index is a measure of the severity. And uh, the higher the number, the more severely ill, the more acutely ill the patients are. And it's an objective measure uh, that is used across uh, the industry uh, to tell how sick your patients are. So first of all, you can see that we have the sickest patients uh, a little bit higher than Loyola, but substantially higher uh, than these other hospitals. Uh, so Christ, Lutheran, Loyola, Northwestern, and Rush. Um, you can see that in absolute numbers, uh, uh, Rush uh, and uh, Christ and uh, Northwestern are similar to ours, but as a percentage, because we are smaller than they are, and we're smaller than all of them other than Loyola, uh, we have a significantly greater percentage. So, so this is part of our mission. We're going to continue to do this, but I just think it's important to understand uh, that this is a challenge for us, uh, and we work hard to be able to continue to do this. Now, if you look from the outpatient, uh, side and in the emergency room, the differences are even more dramatic. And just recall that outpatient Medicaid uh, in Illinois is an absolutely dreadful uh, re reimbursement, both from the hospital side and on the physician side. And here you can see um, the Medicaid outpatient services, uh, 150,000 for uh, University of Chicago, and you can see 80, 71, 45 for our peers. Uh, emergency room Medicaid visits, uh, you can see the differences. And so um, the University of Chicago uh, Medicine, um, the hospital, our physicians uh, provide a huge uh, amount of service uh, to poor patients, to people who live on the south side of Chicago. Um, and uh, 
I think it's just it's important for everybody to, to realize that and to understand that. Okay, so what are the insurance options under the Affordable Care Act? Because the Affordable Care Act is now going to take an existing system and modify it, uh, and it's going to modify it in a number of ways. So the first is employee supported health insurance will continue. So for the for those of us who are insured from either the, the university or the medical center, we expect that that insurance is going to continue uh, in, w without much change, at least initially. I don't know what's going to happen in five or ten years' time, but we have no plans to change that. But the two main changes are going to be expansion of Medicaid uh, and then the creation of these insurance exchanges, which you've read a lot about, and I'll talk to in a moment about them. And these are new marketplaces where people can actually purchase individual insurance coverage. And we'll come to that in a moment. So let's first talk about Medicaid. So as I said, Medicaid is a program that is uh, particularly focused on poor people whose incomes are less than a certain threshold level, but there are certain blind, disabled, you know, other uh, vulnerable uh, uh, people are, are eligible for Medicaid. Um, and uh, nearly all Americans under 65 with incomes under 133% of the federal poverty line will be eligible for Medicaid in states, including Illinois, that chose to expand Medicaid coverage. And so I think you probably know that it was up to the states to decide. That was one of the uh, things that happened with the um, with, with the, the, the lawsuit that was filed that, 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 um, that went to the Supreme Court um, and it became a, a, a state decision and some states have elected to do it uh, and other states have not. Missouri doesn't, for example. Uh, but many of the Republican states, interestingly, of the uh, uh, you know, people who are vigorously opposed uh, to the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, elected to expand Medicaid and I'll, I'll show you why because they have a big incentive to do that. Uh, so states have different rules for Medicaid eligibility because it's a state program, uh, but as you'll see, the federal government will cover the lion's share of the cost. So this is going to be a very important thing in the state of Illinois, and this is what it's going to look like in Illinois. So these are estimates of how many people uh, we think that it's going to be in Illinois, somewhere uh, north of 500,000 new people will be uh, covered under Illinois Medicaid. And at least until 2017, 100% of the cost of that, and these are the estimated costs, this is billions now, uh, is going to be covered by the federal government. And then in 2017, the state will start to kick in, but only pick up 10% of the cost. So that over, a, uh, over this period of time, so between 2014 and 2020, uh, the federal government will put in $12.1 billion and the state will put in $573 million. So a very, very heavily subsidized uh, program. And this was part of the uh, negotiations that were done uh, in getting the Affordable Care Act passed because many of the governors balked at doing it uh, because of the uh, challenges that the state governments were having at the time. Many of them are doing better now than they were then. Now with Illinois Medicaid, um, as we said, uh, more than, uh, than 500,000 new enrollees are anticipated. Um, it, it is known though that a significant percentage of Medicaid eligible people never sign up, so how many people will sign up is unclear, although there are very uh, proactive efforts to get people to sign up, and, and we certainly have very aggressive programs in the hospital uh, to help people who are eligible for Medicaid uh, to sign up for Medicaid so that they can get uh, health insurance. There are a number of things that we did to, 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 uh, in, in Illinois to, to um, facilitate this. This 1115 waiver allowed us to start signing up people even before the uh, act came, in, uh, came, into, um, uh, you know, was, came into being. Um, and so there are 115,000 new enrollees in Cook County. Um, now, now the difficulty is um, that the, the state of Illinois, as you know, and I've alluded to it a on a couple of times already in this talk, uh, the, the state budget is in very substantial deficit, so, so you know about that. And the, the cause of the deficit is two main problems. The one is uh, paying for pensions, and the second is paying for health insurance. So the Medicaid health insurance rolls 
uh, increased dramatically. Uh, Governor Blagojevich, I think appropriately, um, relaxed the criteria uh, which made, allowed people to sign up for Medicaid. Uh, and there was a huge increase in people signing up. Uh, but the result of that is that there, were the, the, there was no plan to pay for it. And so Illinois Medicaid is in substantial deficit. Now they, they, they're trying to do this, they're trying to address this in a number of ways. Uh, by January 2015, they enacted a law uh, which said that 50% of those covered by Illinois Medicaid will be in risk contracts. In other words, the hospitals and the physicians will share in the, uh, in the risk. Um, and uh, in addition to that, as I'll come to in a moment, uh, there is what has been called rate reform. And what rate reform really means is trying to reduce the already low reimbursement rates to hospitals and to physicians uh, in order to save money to try and balance uh, the Medicaid budget. So one thing that I think we know will happen uh, is that there will be a larger Medicaid population, that's for sure. Uh, whether it'll be that number or not, obviously I don't know. Um, and that the projected reimbursement in the aggregate is going to be lower than today because of the over, overarching uh, financial circumstances of the state. So this is a political process, as you may uh, imagine, and we are very active in that regard. We have an outstanding uh, government relations group. Uh, ben Gibson and Susan Sher are the two people who lead it. Uh, they get, wrote me in on regular occasions, and we uh, lobby a variety of different people to try and uh, get uh, support uh, in this reimbursement system for the hospital. Uh, we're arguing for a shift of funding to outpatient reimbursement because outpatient is particularly poorly reimbursed, and I think in the current situation, that's where we uh, are focusing activities, and that's where most of the activity is being focused. We're asking for reimbursement for medical education, um, there's been a move to try and dramatically reduce transplant uh, reimbursement for solid organ transplants and for bone marrow transplants. Uh, we're trying to lobby to have that retained. Um, we are asking for an effective acuity-based reimbursement system. Uh, so uh, we, we are trying to make the case that if you admit a patient uh, that's a normal delivery, um, the costs to the hospital are not the same as if you admit somebody for a heart transplant and that there needs to be an adequate system to recognize the difference in costs to the hospital uh, of those two circumstances and we don't believe that the current system uh, is adequate. And then there are special supplemental payments which we need um, to, uh, to retain. So how this will all turn out, uh, I'm not sure. And um, you know, we'll see what happens. But as you can imagine, there are 200 hospitals in the state of Illinois, and everybody is lobbying. And uh, if you are sitting in DuPage County or up in Wilmette, Winnetka, I don't think there are any hospitals there, but up in that uh, area of the, of, of the Chicago area, you have a different set of incentives and, uh, and desires than if you're uh, practicing in Hyde Park. So let's now talk about the insurance exchanges. So the, the new government health insurance exchanges launched on October the 1st, and the coverage will become effective on January the 1st, 2014. And what was the, the controversy that you're reading about is the, 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 the problems with the, um, the, the, the IT infrastructure and the website for the government insurance programs. Uh, there have actually been private insurance exchanges for a while, and their websites, I think, work pretty well. And I imagine, although I don't know for certain, that the government will get over its IT problems, how long that will take, you know, I have no insight into it all. Uh, but I'm assuming that at some point they will figure it out. Um, now, federal subsidies will limit premium costs to between 2% of income for those with incomes uh, at 133% of poverty guidelines or less, rising to 9.5% of income for those who earn between 300 and 400% of federal uh, poverty guidelines. So, so this is part of the uh, Affordable Care Act, is that uh, the federal government will subsidize poor people to enable them to afford uh, insurance on the exchanges. Now, the exchanges will be available in every state, and they'll either be operated by the states uh, or by the federal government uh, or by the federal-state partnerships. 
And um, in all of these, there are private companies that are now getting into this business uh, of covering Medicaid patients. So they are acting as the agents and the partners of either the federal government or the state government. So it's going to be a complicated um, exchange and a complicated set of options, and, and we'll have to see exactly how it all plays out. Now, the insurance exchanges will then create an alternative and uh, people expect a more price sensitive market uh, to uh, employer based health insurance. So for those people who, don't, who are not covered by uh, their workplace insurance plan, they'll be able to go to the exchange and they will be able to sign up for health care insurance in ways that they were previously unable to do. Um, the rates that we get reimbursed, the rates to the physicians and to the hospitals, are anticipated to be intermediate between commercial insurance and Medicare insurance, although we don't have enough experience with this to know exactly where those rates are going to be, um, and, and we'll see what happens. Now one of the interesting things that is somewhat challenging for us, and it's already starting to happen, is that um, large employers, and certainly medium-sized employers, are taking a look at the finances and they're saying, well, uh, the cost, we can save ourselves a lot of money uh, on this traditional commercial insurance by just giving all of our employees a certain amount of money and saying, go and sign up for the exchange. So whereas previously it might have cost them $10,000 per employee, um, you can get into an exchange for significantly less than that and the estimates are that companies can save themselves around 20% of the cost depending on you know, what the nature of their insurance offerings were. Obviously if it was more generous they may save more than that. If it was less generous they may save less than that but in the aggregate it's around 20%. And so that they offer them that, that's the way in which they cover their health insurance and this complies with the law. Uh, so this will reduce the costs to the employers. Um, it will certainly reduce costs to providers because the uh, reimbursement rates that we're going to be getting is less than commercial. Uh, and almost certainly it will increase the costs to the employees. And uh, we'll show you over here. So, so if you, what is envisioned is that in each of these exchanges, uh, there will be four levels of coverage that you can sign up for. And uh, it's bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And um, they will differ, so everybody, every plan will have a certain minimum amount of coverage. Uh, and then the, w whether you select the one or the other uh, determines on an actuarial basis how much of the cost that, they, that you're expected to uh, incur in your health insurance. So this is not an individual one, it's done on an actuarial basis. That people in the bronze will be, um, will be uh, picking up 40% and the plan will pick up 60%. So the plan will pick up 60 and uh, you'll pick up 40. So those, th that plan has a low premium but a high deductible and a high, high copay. So when you hear about high deductible uh, insurance plans on the exchanges, that's what we're talking about. Predominantly the bronze plans uh, where it's anticipated that you will be picking up 40% of whatever uh, the, the, your health insurance is going to cost and the plan will pick up 60% and you're going to have to uh, pick up the difference. On the other hand, uh, the platinum plan is going to pick up 90% and you're going to pick up 10%. So obviously what's going to happen is in the platinum plan you're going to be paying a high monthly premium and relatively low deductibles and relatively low co-pays. And, and that's the way it will work and I'm assuming, although we don't know exactly how it'll, you know, all the details yet, is that there will be a series of options with different coverage uh, under these uh, four levels uh, of insurance. So, so that's kind of the overview uh, of the um, of, of the insurance options. Now, now how is the Affordable Care Act uh, going to be funded? Because obviously I think everybody understands that if you are going to add uh, 40 million people to the insurance rolls and then switch a whole bunch of people over who were previously covered uh, from their uh, employers uh, to individual plans and you're going to subsidize them, this is going to cost a fair amount of money. It's not going to happen, uh, you know, for nothing. 
So the coverage expansion and other aspects of the Affordable Care Act, uh, there are several mechanisms. So the first is there are substantial cuts in Medicare reimbursements to providers. So this is, as we said, this is the federal program that covers people over the age of 65. And, and as you'll see, uh, there, were, there are significant cuts, and I'll go over the details for the University of Chicago in a moment. Secondly, um, is Medicare and Medicaid uh, dish, dish, this is uh, disproportionate share payments. Up until now we have been getting special payments for taking care of a large number of poor people uh, and uninsured people and we got subsidies from both uh, through Medicare and Medicaid and those have been eliminated uh, or be, are being eliminated actually quite rapidly and the rationale was for that is that in future nobody's not going to have health insurance so, so there's no rationale for the, the disproportionate share payments. Um, there are new annual fees on pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical manufacturing centre. There's an annual fee on the health insurance sector. A new tax on the sale of medical devices. And as you know, with the shutdown of the government, this was a prominent uh, feature. I don't know why this one received so much attention, but it did. Uh, a new tax on payments from, in, from indoor tanning services. So somebody had it in for the indoor tanning services, and uh, you know, they, they, they're really going to take it on the nose. Um, and then starting in 2018, the law imposes a 35% tax on employer provided health plans that exceed $10,200 a year in value for individual coverage and $27,500 for family coverage. So our plans are not at that level. These are the so-called Cadillac plans. Uh, most of them exist through, I presume, either very highly paid executives uh, or uh, unions that have uh, negotiated very um, robust and uh, generous insurance plans as part of their negotiations with employers. Now, this is a uh, slide that's difficult to see, so why don't you focus on the bottom left, but I, I wanted to just uh, show you that it's a credible thing. So this is a uh, material that we received from the Illinois Hospital Association. This is the official organization that represents hospitals in Illinois. It's part of the American Hospital Association, represents all of the hospitals in the United States. And what they did is they analyzed uh, the Affordable Care Act in great detail and then they sent each hospital uh, what they estimated would be the cuts that they would have to um, uh, expect um, as a result of these reductions that we've been talking about. And this is over a 10-year period, so we've got, uh, they're in two categories, existing legislative Medicare cuts and exi existing regulatory Medicare cuts, and the sum total of those over two years is $286 million. So as a result of what's already been enacted, and in fact we're already operating under th these new financial rules, uh, over the next 10 years the medical center will be reimbursed about $300 million less than under current rules, about $30 million a year. Now in addition to that, there are additional c Medicare cuts that are under consideration. And um, I don't know what's going to happen in Congress, just as you don't know what's going to happen, but there is obviously ongoing negotiation between the President and the Democrats and the Republicans to come to an agreement, and we've heard about grand bargains in the past. And the grand bargains all involve trade-offs around these issues. Um, and uh, all the different lobbying groups lobby, uh, but there are a whole series, and we don't have to go into them in detail, um, of additional cuts that are potentially on the table and others that we may not even know about. And what the American Hospital Association estimated that if all of those came to pass, worst case scenario, or maybe not worst case, but this is certainly a bad scenario, there would be an additional $320 million of cuts uh, to the medical center in reimbursement over the next 10 years. So a total of around $600 million, $60 million a year compared uh, to the $30 million. And this is not just, they didn't just single out the University of Chicago, uh, this is the big challenge that is being faced by academic medical centers across the country. Um, and uh, if you go to any of the dean's meetings or the hospital president meetings, you'll see a, a very anxious looking group of people huddled together talking about a variety of things. And this is by and large what they'll be talking about uh, is how are we going to maintain our organizations in a financially uh, viable state uh, and respond appropriately 
uh, to, these, uh, to these cuts. So, so that's uh, kind of the overview of the finances. Um, we, we are, again, you know, it involves a lot of lobbying. Uh, ben Gibson is actually in Washington today, uh, meeting with a variety of people from the Illinois delegation. Some of them are alone. We have a, a we have a lobbyist in Washington. We have a representative of the University of Chicago in Washington. Some of the meetings are together with our uh, peers, with Loyola and with Northwestern and with Rush, and we are. Uh, asking them to uh, maintain funding for graduate medical education, uh, to maintain funding for uh, hospital-based uh, clinics, uh, and we always uh, try and lobby on behalf of the National Institutes of Health, but as you've all noticed, we haven't been particularly successful in that regard, and uh, I wish that we would have been uh, more successful. So. Just to summarize then what the overall dynamic is anticipated to be as a result of the uh, Affordable Care Act. So the, the good news is that um, there are going to be fewer uninsured people in this country, and this is uh, an estimate. Um, we, we had a group of outside advisors, and, and this is the number that they came up with. Uh, you know, these are obviously estimates, um, so what they predict is that uh, in Illinois, uh, Currently, or it's a little less than that now, 2013, there were 1.1 million or whatever the number is, uninsured people, and this is going to go down not to zero, but to somewhere around 400,000. So a very substantial uh, reduction in the number of uninsured people uh, in the state of Illinois. Now, the, the challenges though are that we expect that commercial discharges will, will uh, so this is you know, discharges from the hospital, the number of commercial discharges will also go down significantly and this, will, this is because essentially the growth of the exchanges um, and, uh, and so you can see the two marry each other. Insurance exchange growth getting up to 60,000 discharges, commercial discharges coming down by 60,000. And, and this is a big unknown number. I mean, this I think is potentially our biggest uh, risk uh, is that if the um, reduction in commercial discharges were at a 10% rate, for example, given what I told you previously about our, how our finances uh, are, uh, are supported uh, or how our programs are supported from a financial standpoint, that would be a very, very serious challenge for us. Uh, Medicare discharges are anticipated to go up as part of everybody getting older, um, and Medicaid discharges are also going to go up, and this is the feature of uh, you know, increasing Medicaid and covering these uninsured people through the Medicaid program uh, predominantly in the state of Illinois. So, so that's the dynamic, and, and uh, you can see there are many good things about it from a population standpoint, and then if you look at it from the University of Chicago Medicine standpoint financially, this is a real challenge for us, very, very difficult. So the, the summary of it is that the economic benefit of a smaller uninsured population uh, is more than offset by the costs of the low Medicaid reimbursement and the need for us to assume risk. Uh, the marked reduction in revenue streams that we receive through the Medicare program uh, and additional cuts being considered as part of a budget grand bargain that would compound an already difficult situation uh, for the medical center and for the biological sciences division. Now, um, the erosion of the reimbursements that we receive from commercial insurance may be the major financial risk, and this is uh, a big unknown. Uh, shift of commercial insurance to exchanges and then downward pressure uh, on commercial rates. Okay, so, so what is our response? Um, and, you know, obviously this is challenging, but I, I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't believe that we could meet the challenge. Uh, and I'm actually confident that we'll be able to do it. We, we, we have to figure it out. And, uh, you know, at this point I think nobody does. But, but we are actually looking at things in great detail. And, and what we are seeing in Illinois, if you analyze the data in Illinois in the last couple of years, is that these national trends are exactly happening over here. Commercial insurance has been declining. Um, as I said, by 2015, 50% of Medicaid will be in risk contracts. Uh, health systems have been consolidating, uh, and uh, everybody is thinking about geographic expansion through making partnerships, and you uh, open the newspaper on a regular basis and you learn about some other partnership between one hospital and a health, health systems, one hospital and another hospital, uh, physicians and hospitals, etc. Now, 
Um, we, we did, uh, we, when we, we looked at our finances, uh, together with the uh, advice of an outside consultant, um, what we, uh, what we uh, found was that in 2013, we had a positive operating margin. Uh, this line over here uh, is the uh, revenue, the red line at the bottom is the expenses, and they predicted that in 2014, if we didn't make some changes, uh, that the uh, revenue line and the expense line would come together. Um, and thereafter, if we didn't make any changes, uh, the expenses would uh, exceed the revenues and we would be in an operating deficit situation. And so what they told us is that for 2014, if we, w if we did nothing, we would be down here at about minus $20 million a year. And if we did a series of things, we could get ourselves up to around $40 million. But that required taking about $60 million out of the hospital budget or improving efficiency. So it's the combination of taking money out of the budget or making things more efficient uh, to get to $60 million that we didn't previously have. And so this was not uh, apparent to most of you, but uh, the budget process led by Sharon O'Keefe and uh, the uh, vice presidents and other leaders in the hospital with a lot of involvement from faculty was to really try and do that. Um, and we are actually on target at this point uh, to, 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 to be somewhere around $40 million. And, and there were a whole series of interventions, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, which enabled us to get there. Now it's early days yet, and I'm not uh, by any means complacent about it, but I'm not discouraged. Now, as you can see, as time goes on and some of these additional cuts kick in, over time, the situation doesn't actually get better, it gets worse. And by uh, FY18, uh, we, have to ha we have a bogey of about $100 million. And you can also pick up the newspaper on a regular basis and you can learn that X hospital is laying off employees and they have to take, uh, you know, at the University of Pittsburgh, which has got a huge uh, network, they're trying to take a billion dollars out of their operating budget. And everybody has got a set of curves that look just like this. I mean, the, the, the details are different, but the principles are the same. At essentially every hospital in the United States, obviously if you are in an academic situation like we are, if you're in an inner city area like we are with a lot of poor people who you take care of, um, then the challenges are greater. But everybody is facing this uh, to a greater or lesser extent and it is a significant challenge which we have to figure out how to deal with. So, so what we we, we, we went through this um, strategic planning process. There was, an, as I said, an outside consultant. There were about 60 people involved. That included faculty and department chairs, section chiefs, the members of the board of trustees, uh, senior leaders from the hospital. And uh, there were a number of um, ways that were identified to improve our revenue uh, and to reduce our cost and improve efficiency. And obviously, uh, it's, it's obvious that the two will work together. Uh, so we, uh, revenue growth, the key is building eminent clinical programs. I think that's always the, the basic thing that sells very well and that's what we absolutely have to continue to do. Uh, we have to uh, continue to improve the patient experience, uh, the quality of care, uh, the quality of the experience and the safety. Uh, we have to build and expand a network uh, by, uh, you know, establishing relationships with hospitals, with health systems. We have to broaden our geographic presence uh, outside just Hyde Park. Uh, we have to develop novel payment methodologies such as bundled payments and how we take risk. Um, in reducing cost, we have to improve productivity and throughput in the operating rooms, on the inpatient beds, in outpatient clinics, in the emergency room. And, 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 and there's already evidence that that's happening, that uh, through the same number of operating rooms, we're doing significantly more operations. Uh, there's a huge amount of opportunity in the outpatient clinic. We did not efficiently use the DCAM. The average number of turns per half day in the DCAM was two turns per half day. Two patients per half day session the average number of patients seen per room in the DCAM over a, over a five day period, that's not to say that on Wednesday afternoon, which was the preferred, or Wednesday morning, which might have been the preferred time that every physician wanted to be in the clinic, you know, there weren't six turns per room, but on the average, you take 360, you know, the number of days that we work, five days a week, two turns per room, two patients in a four hour session. So you can't make it if you have that sort of metric. Okay. Um, 
reduced cost of uh, purchased uh, goods and services. And John Stegner is sitting there. He's uh, the head of our um, uh, supply chain, and he has actually done absolute wonders. Uh, for reducing the cost of uh, supplies, uh, negotiating contracts with uh, people that, that we purchase stuff from, um, and doing it in a really uh, clever way, working closely with physicians. He has saved us multiple, multiple millions of dollars. Um, reducing average length of stay, reducing episode costs for complex conditions. And this involves very close collaboration between the physicians and the nurses and the hospital and figuring out, you know, how can we deliver care, uh, care that is as good or better at lower cost? Can we use generic drugs? Can we reduce the length of stay? Can we not do as many MRI scans as we did before? A whole variety of things that we can do. We need to build capabilities in population health management, and this is a tough one. Uh, and, uh, but we have a number of people who are quite experienced. Brenda Battle is uh, sitting there. She had experience with us in St. Louis, and Sharon and I recruited her from Barnes Hospital. And next to her is Mayumi Fukui, who heads our uh, managed care program, uh, does the contracting. And she, together with a number of the physicians, and David Meltzer is very important in this regard, and Stacey Lindau has programs. Uh, we're trying to figure out how can we enter this world of population health management, where we can help take care of broader populations, take risk, and still provide outstanding care at an affordable cost. And then we have to align the BSD clinical programs with the hospital goals, and I think that goes without saying, and, and this is a, a, a process that is actually starting to work very well, and we've identified a number of important areas uh, where we are investing in programs in the BSD um, and, and uh, in, in the hospital and growing them together. Um, so, so if you look at the five uh, imperatives uh, that we're focusing on, uh, the first is to build a network that will increase commercial business and broaden our footprint. Um, the second is to develop new reimbursement models uh, while allowing us to continue to leverage fee-for-service as long as it's in existence. Um, we have to develop a cost-competitive position, and th there we, we need the support of the faculty. Um, transform the care delivery model across inpatient and uh, ambulatory settings, and then align clinic and academic missions through transparent funds flow and incentives, and that's a work in progress. <coughs> so I would say that um, this is a, a, a doable thing. Um, it's not going to be easy. Uh, it's not business as usual. So I, the first message that I would have for you is that we're going to have to alter our uh, our way of doing business uh, to incorporate uh, you know, the things that we've been speaking about today. Uh, at the heart of it is outstanding clinicians who provide innovative, leading edge patient care focused on complex conditions, uh, patient centered, high quality service with the highest standards of patient safety. Uh, we need to be cost effective. In other words, we need to be able to go to the payers and we need to say uh, we provide value from an economic perspective when you take into account the complexity and the outcomes so that even though bone marrow transplants are not the cheapest at the <coughs> University of Chicago, when you take into the account that we have the best outcomes of all of our peers or we're at the 99th percentile, whatever it is, um, it's worth the additional investment. Um, we need to integrate patient care with research and education. And this has always been the way in which we've differentiated ourselves from our competitors and will continue to be in the future. So although the Affordable Care Act will challenge us in many ways, uh, if we can reach these goals, I'm confident that we will continue to be successful. So I'm delighted that we, I had the opportunity, that you gave me the opportunity to do this, and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions. for spending time talking to our crew here today. Um, and just get a quick question, I'll start off with the first one, really focusing upon the University of Chicago. You had a key slide in the beginning about a uh, left-hand column was the current need for service system, right-hand column, population management, research-based systems. And you said specifically that right now, the University of Chicago does not have the infrastructure or capability to do risk uh, uh, plans well. What is the infrastructure and capability that needs to be developed? What are the plans to develop that? Um, you know, it's a variety of different things. I think very central to that is going to be information systems. 
Uh, so it's going to be information systems that is going to give us real-time readouts of how people are doing. Um, you know, prospective, um, uh, we discharge a patient from the hospital. Um, they go and see somebody in our network who's a primary care physician. The primary care physician doesn't know what's going on. They order an MRI scan. Uh, we, w in order to effectively manage a population, in a cost-effective way. Now that particular MRI scan may have been indicated, but it may not have been indicated. We're going to need to have information regarding that. Medicine reconciliation, for example, is a huge issue. You know, we looked at this in St. Louis, and what we found is that when we discharged people from the hospital, they had multiple fillings of the same prescription from different providers. And Often they didn't even know that these were the same medications. One physician wrote, so, so, so that's going to be essential. Uh, we're going to have to uh, have uh, reach out into the community, so we're going to have to have a much tighter relationship uh, with providers, such as federally qualified health centers, such as other community hospitals on the south side of Chicago, where we can rationalize uh, decisions about who gets admitted where. So that if somebody has a routine pneumonia and they need to come into the hospital for a couple of days of antibiotics, they don't have to go into the Center for Care and Discovery. They should go into a community hospital which is qualified and able to provide exactly the same level of care at a lower cost. And when the person, if they get really sick and they need to be intubated in the ICU or you know something really bad happens, they get transferred to the University of Chicago. So, so it, it needs to have an infrastructure that has strong relationships between the, 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 the home medical center and then uh, resources in the community um, and then the information systems to monitor in a much more real-time way what's happening uh, to patients and how to intervene uh, both to improve outcomes but also to reduce cost. No. No, these, these are under the Affordable Care Act. So currently, um, it's approximately 50-50, although the state of Illinois, there's a subsidy from the hospital, so they, they, don't, they pay about a third. So at the moment, the, 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 the state of Illinois pays about a third, the federal government pays 50%, and then there's this tax which pays, um, uh, the, which pays about 15%. It differs in each state. This is what's going forward. So, so this was in, in order to get people to sign up. Yeah. And so what does that give us as an understanding going Yeah, forward? and unfortunately, that, you know, that doesn't impact the state. I mean, that impacts the city budget. And so the, 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 the state budget is a completely separate uh, issue. And um, you know, what, what he's trying to do is tr he's trying to balance the city budget, and the, fundamentally the only way he can do it is by raising all of our property taxes. Phil. Um, you know, I don't know that I can answer that, Phil. <laughs> I think what you, you know, I, 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 you, can, you, you can turn on the TV at any point in time, and depending on which channel you choose, you'll get a different answer. So if you choose Fox, you'll get one channel, you'll get one answer. If you choose MSNBC, you'll get another, another answer. And I'm not smart enough to figure it out. All I know is that some people love it and some people hate it, and uh, you, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you can, you can understand that if you're against government, you, you're not going to be happy with this. But you know, a lot of these elements of the, of the plan are actually very good elements. And the, the issue is, how do we implement it and how do we 
uh, afford it. And, and that's what we're focusing on. And uh, you know, this is not a political thing at all. I mean, we, we are, we're just trying to figure out how can we continue to provide outstanding service to our patients? How can we continue to provide a venue uh, where our faculty can continue to do research and our students can continue to be trained, our students and our residents? And um, you know, as I said, we have uh, you know, and as you heard from both Brenda and Mayumi, we have particular challenges in Illinois, which are unfortunate. Uh, but, you know, we'll just have to figure it out. So tomorrow. Tomorrow's next. You tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> There's been a lot of data lately pointing to most of you care as a big source of the variation in costs around the acute care episode. Um, and obviously, most of you care takes on uh, a crucial importance in, in funding payments and, and delivering care models like ACOs. So what has the University of Chicago Medicine been doing in terms of improving the effectiveness in our choice of post acute care providers and in sort of monitoring yeah. services and quality over the yeah. time? So, so we have a huge focus on that. Brenda Battle is the person who is sort of helping spearhead this. So Brenda, would you like to answer the question? next. Yeah, um, you know, so obviously that's critical, um, and that's part of the driver of why we are very actively engaged at the moment in trying to establish these relationships. Uh, as I said, Mayumi Fukui is the person who negotiates on our behalf. Uh, she does it in an absolutely outstanding way, and we, we're going to hopefully use both our name, uh, the quality of our physicians and our hospital and the services that we provide to, and, and the efficiency of our care to be able to get the best rates. So it's a, it has to be an absolutely central part of the strategy. Uh, you know, the rate at which you're paid uh, is an absolutely key determinant. Uh, trauma has an impact on our community. Um, as you know, there are trauma centers from Southside. And a um, study came out earlier this year from the American Journal of Public Health by Marie Crandall called Trauma's Deserve, or Trauma Death Deserve. Um, and what uh, it said is um, the longer it takes to travel to a trauma center, the greater your chance of dying. Sorry. Um, understand you have the power to expand access to trauma care. I'm not here today to actually do the right thing and help us get a trauma center. Now, the meeting on May 28, you said that you would collaborate with others to expand access to trauma care. And we're trying to get hospital leaders together to find a solution. Advocate Trinity even offered or suggested to host the trauma center, but we need your help. Um, so again, I'm here today to actually do the right thing to come to the table. Now, I'm no doctor, but I know a lot about maladies, ailments, and illnesses. And the illness that's plaguing in our community is the lack of a trauma center, and you have a remedy. So again, I'm not asking you to come to the table. We have a meeting this coming January with hospital leaders on the South Sound and we send an invitation for you to attend. All I know is you're willing to commit to attend. 
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not committing here. I mean, that's not the purpose of this, uh, you know, to come and ask me to make commitments. I, I think what I've shown you here is that the University of Chicago is extremely committed to the health of the community. Uh, we have a level one trauma center in Coma Children's Hospital. We have a burn unit. I showed you the numbers uh, on our provision of care to Medicaid patients on the south side. We have a finite capacity to take on challenges. What I hope I've shown you today is that our plate is extremely full. At the moment, fortunately, uh, our big problem is we don't have enough beds. And we are struggling on a daily basis to figure out how to do how to continue to provide uh, care in the, shortage, in the face of shortage of beds and shortage of uh, access in the emergency room and a variety of other things. Uh, and, and we will continue to do that. Uh, we don't have the capacity to start a level one trauma center. The basic issue that I've spoken about many times is that 20 years ago, there were 5,300 inpatient beds on the south side of Chicago. There are now 2,000. And as a result of the 60% reduction in inpatient beds on the south side of Chicago, it has fallen on a very small number of providers to provide health care. And so we are doing the best we can. Uh, to take on a trauma center would have a major impact on the existing programs, and it's not what we intend to do. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I, Monica, I think you've raised a really important uh, question and a really important issue, and you've pointed out that at the moment uh, we are um, focused largely on specialty care. Uh, we have some primary care, it's of high quality, but it's relatively small, and we're going to have to figure out how to uh, acquire additional capacity in primary care. Um, you know, if you just, so, so some of it we will invest ourselves, but if you look at the cost, of uh, acquiring you know, a primary care network of scale that we would need. Uh, it's actually unrealistic for us to do that at this point, you know, given the financial uh, challenges that, that I've outlined previously. So I think that what we will do uh, is we will expand modestly in Hyde Park and in selected areas, and then we will partner uh, with existing programs. And uh, you know, we are in the process of trying to f you know, develop strategies along those lines, uh, but we, we clearly are going to need to have collaborative arrangements which will allow us to refer patients to primary care physicians who are in our network. I don't believe that they all need to be employed by the University of Chicago. They don't all need to be uh, University of Chicago faculty. They do need to have a certain minimum level of quality and experience and board certification and so on. And, and that's one of the challenges that we face. But, but primary care is going to be important, or is important. So it's way back. That was a, Richard Kirk, MC Bay. Or yeah, there's been a lot of data that indicates that the high cost of, uh, of uh, health insurance is to the older population. A lot of money is spent there. And uh, there it could seem to be a way of trying to, uh, I know they talked about death panels and that previously, but giving counseling to people at that age for the families and that so that they don't have to go trying to to uh, do all these extra procedures to try to keep a person where yeah. counseling could be very beneficial right. and really would reduce a lot of costs. Yeah. You know, I, I think that uh, over time, um, you know, addressing difficult issues like that of, of, of where do we invest our healthcare dollars and, you know, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, it, it's, it's, a, it's a debate that we have not ever had in this country and we're going to have to have that debate sooner or later. Um, but as you have pointed out, it's very emotional. Um, it's very difficult to have a rational discussion. Um, and unfortunately, if you just raise the topic, it immediately leads to allegations of death panels. So I don't know on a broader scale we can have that discussion in here. And, and as you know, the decision is a complicated interaction between the family and the patient and the doctor, and the, et cetera. So uh, it's a key issue, and I don't know how that discussion will get started in this country, but it needs to be. Dr. Ponsi, thank you very much for your talk. I appreciate it. I have one quick question for you. Would you mind elaborating on the way the university is facilitating the enrollment of some of the Medicaid eligibles that are not signed up at this time? <coughs> uh, 
Dr. Bonson mentioned the um, 1115 waiver and county health care rolling 115,000 Medicaid lies into the expansion. That enrollment or that um, uh, assigning those first person persons up is happening at the federally qualified health centers. We are now currently looking at an opportunity to become a certified organization in signing people up for the exchanges. We've not finalized that, but we're in the process of completing that application. It seems to me that the economic state of the South Side is a big factor in the challenge here. And it got me wondering what the university, and the university is a big economic force on the South Side. So it made me wonder, could the, what more could the university do to help the South Side be in a better economic state? Um, you know, there are many pro, so you're correct. Uh, the, the University of Chicago is, um, is already, uh, I think, the, the major economic e engine on the south side of Chicago. Uh, so between the BSD, the medical center, and the university, we employ about 15,000 people. Um, the investment in buildings, not just the CCD, but all of the extensive buildings that are going on on the University of Campus, if you haven't noticed, you can just go across Ellis Avenue and you'll see lots of cranes all over the place. Um, those have provided a substantial number of uh, construction jobs. Um, there are very um, proactive programs, and uh, you know, Brenda might talk about them, in which we are focused on providing uh, contracts in the regular part of our business uh, to uh, firms owned by minorities and by women uh, and also ensuring that there is uh, adequate um, representation of people who live on the south side. Uh, there, is a, there are programs, there's a program that the U Chicago Promise uh, that the university started, I believe it was last year, uh, to help uh, young kids from the south side apply to college uh, and they provide them with assistance. So, so there, are, there are a whole series of, I think, very constructive um, and productive uh, programs that the university broadly has started. We have many uh, in the University of Chicago Medicine, in the Urban Health Initiative and in other areas. I'm, I'm sure we can always do more, and if people have suggestions of programs, you know, the, the, the list of programs uh, that have been uh, implemented successfully is very long. And, and in fact, if you, it comes from all over the place. The medical students and the, med and the, and the residents uh, have done an unbelievable job in starting and staffing free clinics uh, in underserved neighborhoods. Uh, we have faculty who go to federally qualified health centers. Uh, we provide um, services in you know, interventions uh, to, to people from federally qualified health centers. So there are very extensive uh, interactions. I'm certainly not saying that we couldn't do more, um, but, but I think we're doing a lot. One more question. It's a far right. Affordable Care Act, uh, the Community Health Needs Assessment. I mean, in 2010, the Hospital's Community Health Needs, thank you, uh, the Hospital's Community Health Needs Assessment identified <coughs> violence and injury as an important strategic uh, plan, but it was not implemented uh, in the 2010 health thing. But in this, in this same plan, it says that in 2014, the hospital is interested in convening a meeting of other doctors, um, healthcare providers, and community groups to address um, violence and injury on the south side. Um, so I guess I just ask again, how uh, how does the hospital plan on doing this? Um, it's in the Affordable Care Act and the Community Health Needs Assessment um, published by the hospital. Um, so maybe that is kind of framing it more in the language that you were looking for. But how does the hospital plan to commit uh, to doing this in the next year? Yeah. So um, again, Brenda's spearheading our efforts in that regard and uh, is behind the community benefit uh, programs that we have. So I'd like to start by saying that the community um, needs assessment, the community actually said that the most pressing needs were access to health care, people who visit our emergency department more than twice a year, obesity for children, diabetes for adults, asthma for children, and colorectal cancer and breast cancer. Those are the needs that the community told us were the greatest needs. Yes, we did also say that um, <coughs> STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, and crime and violence were their issues, their 
an important need as well. What we are addressing in the next year or two are the most uh, uh, priority needs that the community set. And as we do that, what we committed to do was to talk with and discuss with other organizations the public health issue around climate violence and that we would engage in the larger public health issue and those discussions. So that's what we're going to do. So next week, Helen Darling, CEO, National Business Improvement Health, from a large employer perspective. Round of applause for Dean Polanski.